Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. So I was going through one interesting article by Ethan McHugh, so which uh, speaks about you know 13 to 14 important Postgres SQL patterns that you need to consider when you are dealing with any kind of SQL database as such. I mean, it's not only about Postgres SQL, but it's a common practice that you can you know follow across all the type of SQL databases that are out there. All right. So this incredible guide, uh, you know, that will transform how you how you design your Postgres schema. So it starts with a very interesting line. Believe it or not, I don't think that this title is a clickbait. It's it's actually true. When I went through all the best practices, right, and the patterns, I was also amazed. Yeah, this should what we should follow. All right. So let's start with the first one. Right. So the first one is to use you know UUIDs as primary keys. Let's begin with primary keys first, right? Most developers start with you know integer based auto increment IDs. I mean, whenever you are creating a, a table, you ideally have an ID column which is auto incremental manner, right? But in this article, uh, Ethan is suggesting you know using UUIDs instead of the integer based primary keys, and there is a good reason for that. Why the UUIDs is also known as you know universally unique identifier all right so this is uh, this uid basically offers decentralized generation which means if you have multiple distributed databases right just think about having auto increment id if you have two distributed database of two distributed nodes each of them will be starting the count from one right but using uids it offers a decentralized generation of the ids which means no coordination is required across multiple instances of your SQL cluster. So especially this is useful in the microservices or distributed architecture. All right. Now let's jump to the second point. Second point is timestamps for auditing. I mean, give everything created at and updated at field. So every table should include created at and updated at field. All right. Now you might think why it is needed because they make the auditing and debugging, uh, debugging for any issue or anything uh, far easier because you will know that when a record was created or when a record was updated, right? What you, when, when it was last updated. At first you might think, yeah, I don't need a created date or, or updated field for this table, particular table, but you never know you might need. So it's always better to keep a column and you can even automate the updated date field with a trigger, right? Or you can have this just define it like this. So it will automatically create the columns for you. You don't need to explicitly insert the values when you are inserting records to the database. So the one good point that he has mentioned, it's also something you can't ret retroactively get unless you are recording it. If at some point of time, if you feel the need of, you know, getting the created it and updated it field for a particular record in a table, you won't get it because you did not record itself. So there is no other way to get it uh, apart from recording it uh, explicitly. So that's what the second point is about. Next important point is having an update restrict and on delete restrict clause in your uh, foreign key constraints. We usually use on delete cascade. When you do a delete cascade, that means there is two table, one is parent table, one is child table. Multiple records of child table is referencing to one key from the parent table. If parent is deleted, I mean that row let's say is deleted from parent, all the reference or the foreign key link child records will also be deleted automatically by the database. That's what the cascade delete does. But update restrict and delete restrict becomes a little bit more stricter in nature. All right. The reason to use this is, you know, when you put a update restrict or delete restrict, for example, if you see we have a person table here, which is a UID created at updated and name field, etc. Then we have a pet. And pet, we have a owner ID field to specify who is the owner of the pet, right? So you see, we have mentioned on update restrict. Now, what it will do, if you want to delete a record from the person table, let's say person A or person Ramesh, he has a dog as a pet and he is the owner. And for some reason, if you want to delete a Ramesh record from the person table, the database will throw an error because you have put a update restrict or you have put a delete restrict, right? So you need to ensure key R. you need to ensure that all the child rows are deleted before you want to delete the parent record. But in cascade, it won't give, give you a warning. It will just, you know, if you have mentioned like cascade delete, it will allow you to delete the parent record. It will automatically delete all the child record also. So that works in a silent manner, which might be unwanted. Let's say by mistake, you deleted the parent record. All the child records are gone. There's no way to recover now, right? So it's better to use delete restrict and update restrict instead of using cascade update or cascade delete so update restrict is, restrict is also like that only uh, if you are updating some field some uh, set of primary keys in the parent table which are being referenced 
here we are only you know referencing only one field as the foreign key let's say you are refer referring to multiple keys as a foreign key in the child table so if you are updating any one of the keys in the parent table then this update will also be restricted because you need to first update all the fields of the primary key in the child table first and then you need to update the parent table let's say percent table for example let's say you used uuid then let's say a phone number or email of this person as the combined composite primary key right now you want to update the email and that that key is also stored as the uh, stored in the pet table let's say right as the foreign key so if you want to update the email of the person you need to update the email in all the child records which is referencing to that email then it will allow you to update the parent record so that's what the update restrict do so this is what they mentioned better to throw an error or throw an warning uh, about deleting and updating then to do something like cascade like silently deleting or updating records next is using the schemas so by default if you see in a psql database if i just bring it here you'll find multiple schemas let's say right and you'll find a default schema called public usually all the tables if you are working in a small organization you can put all the tables here only in the public schema but as your project grows using schemas become essential because instead of dumping everything into this public schema you can create domain specific schema uh, like let's say there is a person schema which can you know store all the it can have all the tables related to a person right it's like occupancy job details everything then you can have a wet wet uh, schema right where you can record details related to all the vets the persons the pets that are available right and the good thing is even if you create schema so let's say let's say a public schema right like this you will have another schema called vet another schema called avcd the good thing is you can perform joins across multiple uh, tables across multiple schema postgres sql won't restrict you on that but this is not i think possible in mysql because there is no concept of schema i guess in mysql uh, there you need to create separate databases itself to you know logically separate the uh, schemas so in that case the joining becomes little bit difficult because but here in psql because all the schemas lies under the same database only you can easily just perform cross joins like uh, normal table joins only right so you can do joins and have a relationship between tables in different schemas so there is not much of a downside that's what uh, he has mentioned here schemas work as a namespace for tables and for any moderate to large app you are going to have a lot of tables this is good I and mean, this is a great point i mean just like i mentioned it next up is the enum table in psql there are a lot of ways to create enums one is to you know define the enum types like this if you see here this is the check constraint we will go to the enum types okay sorry yeah if you see you can create you know enumerated types using this create type command all right let's say sad okay happy but instead of using postgres sql's built in enum uh, command like this you can always create a lookup table extra table because if you go ahead with this approach like creating uh, enums using the create type and enum command you need to do ddl operations to you know change them or you know manage them everything right but a separate table having a separate enum table for uh, enums it gives you flexibility and extensibility and you can manage it like a, another table only also you can reference it like a foreign key only for example here we have created a pet kind table where we have three types of pet dog cat and bird right this, this is the enum table pet kind is the enum table and in the pet table in the wet schema in the pet table we have a kind field right which references the value key of the pet kind table that's how you can define the relationship between the enums and for a particular record in a, another table so this way as i told you can obviously always come up with you know some description for that particular enum let's say you can have some additional detail, uh, details about the particular enum field so this way it gives you, you know extending the explainability and description of the particular your schema table enum table instead of just using the enum types like this there is no scope to have a description for this right having a separate table it helps you do that so that's the benefit of having a enum table instead of using the built-in enum types in psql all right next point is naming your table singularly just please name your tables using the singular form of a noun let's say you have a pet table instead of naming it as pets you just name it as pet now why what is the reason let's see i have also forgot select star from pets might seem nicer than select star from pet but the moment you start doing anything more interesting with your queries you will notice that your queries are actually working in terms of individual rows for example what is mentioning this seems like a plural activity that we are doing or selecting all rows but as soon as we put a condition here basically we are talking about a particular single row now 
right? This is just, you know, this is not a mandatory thing, but this is what you can put as a standard practice in your organization and you can start naming your table in a singular manner. So let's move on to the next point. This is a quite interesting point. When you join two tables, let's say we have person table and a pet table, right? Pet owner, I mean, when you join these two table, then the join, join table, you can name it as pet owner. That seems nice at the beginning, right? But if you just, uh, you know, mechanically join the name, mechanically means you take the name of the first table, take the name of the second table, join it with using underscore. That means I just want to demonstrate the table A underscore table B naming scheme. That means create table with person pet. It automatically states that, yeah, the two tables that are joined is the person and pet without looking at the further queries or the detailed queries. So this is again a best practice and it's a good practice that you should follow when you are uh, working on join joint table. Next is a quite important point again, always, almost always do soft delete. Soft delete means instead of directly deleting the actual physical row from the memory database itself, just mark it as like uh, that it is deleted. You can either maintain a flag, key a flag uh, deleted, one or zero. One means deleted, zero means not deleted. Instead of doing a hard delete, hard delete means you are just completely removing the row. You're just doing a delete uh, star from ABCD where ID is equal to let's say XYZ. But instead of doing that, you have a flag, that kind of thing you can have a flag, or you can have a, you know, have a, a nullable timestamp a TZ column. So if there is a timestamp filled in, that means you can mark it as when it was deleted. I mean, there are multiple ways based on your choice. One is to have a flag. That's the most convenient way I feel. Another way is to, you know, just uh, have multiple timestamp field like issued it, revoked it. Using this uh, timestamp wala field, it gives you two things. You know when the activity was performed along with just maintaining a flag. This is one more. Yeah, this is a good way. We have a revoked it field whose value is timestamp tj and it's, it can be null, right? So if it is deleted, you just mark the... Uh, time when it was revoked so you put that uh, revoked field so if revoked field is null not null that means the row was deleted that's how you can treat with the records so it gives you a you know information about when the particular action was delete action was performed on that particular row so that's about doing soft delete next thing is always represent statuses as log let's say we have a row we have a record uh, let's say you have an application, you have a job application that you have put in, right? It goes to multiple stages, applied and under process, then approved or rejected multiple stages. So in order to, you know, store the multiple stages of the application, what you can do, the simple plain naive thing that comes into mind, yeah, I'll just update the status field every time, the status changes. Now it is under uh, under review, status is under review. Uh, after review, let's say the status was changed to, let's say, approved. Then you just, you know, rewrite, override the under review status with the approved status. This might, you know, seem nice in the beginning, but as your application grows and you want to have proper auditing across all the activities that has been done on, for a particular record, this becomes tricky and bottleneck in your application because you are just overriding, overriding the status. Instead of that, what you can do, you can create separate record for each entry. Application is applied, you create a record, insert in the database. Application is under process, you create another record and insert in the database with the under process status. It is approved, put another record with the same application ID and the status as approved. This way you, it will help you maintain a log. That's what it is saying, represent statuses as log. So you might actually care about when it was approved and by whom. And you, you might receive this information out of order, right? Sometimes the information may come out of order, right? Approved uh, status comes even before the you know under process status was received by the client for some reason there is some network delay or some reason we don't know so information if you are receiving information out of order just overwriting the things can might get confusing let's say approved status came first you mark the status as approved then under process again came for some reason you are marking it as under uh, you are overwriting it as under under review so the you know application status doesn't state the proper thing right so that's why you need to maintain the status as log instead of just overwriting the status on a single record. So now if we just move on to the next thing, use views sparingly. This is an uh, important point. Let's say when you are, we know about views. Views is just, you know, a curated version of a curated uh, representation of a particular table. Let's say we have a parent table like this, right? The main table. But you want to create a view to see the active prescription. So that's how you create a view from the uh, main table, prescription table. This is the prescription table that we have. We, fetch some information and create a view. So creating views, it is definitely helpful, but 
you know uh, they are terrible in that uh, removing obsolete columns if they some column is obsolete here some some column is removed from this right so what you need to do you, do, you need to delete this view and recreate it again okay basically you need to drop the view and recreate it again because the updates are not propagated to the views in sync so using views is good no doubt but if you have you know nested views like let's say you created a view from this view you are creating another view so that means if something is changed here then you need to you know recursively go through the i mean go down through the entire views hierarchy and update each of the view one by one so that might seem a nightmare and it, it might uh, seem tedious so always use views but only as many as you need all right don't use uh, you know just uh, views is a feature just uh, don't use it blindly for any anything or everything just create views for whatever things you need and if that makes sense then only you use views or just rely on the normal queries so the final point we have with is the json queries so postgres sql supports json you must have heard about this ki yeah postgres supports json but it is not only that you know you just stringify the json document and store it as a string string column in the postgres no it actually supports json and it also supports json queries now what is the benefit you can actually you know uh, connect to multiple tables and get the you get your required information in one trip right instead of doing complex uh, joins on the multiple let's say you have, you have three tables we have a pet person table here right then we have a pet table here then we have a prescription table here all right so instead of in order to get a record from all the three tables combined together ideally what we'll do we'll do a join operation right we'll join table a with table b table b with table c then we'll get the record then we'll convert it to json and send it to the user send it to the front end or the send it to the server or the client whoever it is but using a json query instead of performing those complex one you can actually in an iterative manner you can create queries and you can you know one by one you fetch the record then fetch record from another table then using using that reference fetch record from another table combine everything together and get the response so if you see here the output of this query comes with a beautiful you know json object as you want but if you don't use json queries you will have to do complex json uh, joins table joins basically and there is n plus 1 problem also n plus 1 problem in you have a table a you have a table b they are linked with using a foreign key somehow if you want a record for a row in the table a and it has some reference records are there in the table b basically you have to first get the record from table a then you have to run one additional query to get the reference record from table b right or if you don't want to do that you might you want to do the join so you have either two choices right you either join the both table or you individually query the first record get the id individually query the second table get the uh, result combine them together and send it they, they are the only two ways you can perform this uh, operation so that's what known as the n plus one query you get the record from one table you perform one more extra query if you are using join then complex you know Cartesian product nightmare comes if your table a has 10 records table b has 5 records joining them makes makes it 50 records let's say right if you are doing n or z so instead of going through the i mean instead of getting into those complexity you can just simply use json queries it will just get get you all the records in one sort one trip and all the beautifully json objects output you will get using the json queries so this is what a powerful feature of json queries which is often used but most of them don't know how to use it and if it is there or not also many of them don't know so yeah that's about today's you know some of the best practices and life changing postgres sql patterns that you need to follow so these patterns might seem small but you know together they create a database design that's you know modular safe and it's maintainable for the long term so yeah massive credit to ethan macu for his uh, interesting and uh, insightful uh, article uh, i'll put the link of this article in the description you can go through it and uh, use it further all right so if you found this video helpful and valuable drop a like let's target for 50 likes for this video if you have any doubts let's discuss in the comment section let's target for uh, 4k subscribers by the end of this month so keep supporting and thank you for watching this video and we'll see you in the next one thank you